Uh, here's a message the Lord put on my heart last week, and and I've called it Unity in the Spirit. And I have a text of Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And we're just going to be sharing for a few minutes, to, well, more than a few minutes, but we're going to share a little bit about unity in the Spirit. How many knows that God wants us to be unified? Amen. Amen. How many knows that on the day of Pentecost, they were in one mind and one accord? That's right. Amen. And the Spirit came and He fell. He, he came and He filled them all. He filled them all. Uh, anyway, Philippians 2, 1 through 4 is my text. And, and the Philippian church was a strong church. It was a strong church. You say, wow, with a strong church, anything's possible. Amen. Well... There's some things we need to learn, even about a strong church, you know. Uh, when a church is strong, it is always full of vision and planning. That sounds like our life, too. Our lives are full of vision and planning as well. And it's always working out a strategy to carry forth the gospel. That's what a strong church will do. Working out a strategy to carry out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, it launches out ministry after ministry and program after program, and it it's never still, never complacent. That's what a strong church is like. Uh, neither are the minds of the people nor the hands of the people. You know, they're, they're constantly busy doing something in a strong church. Amen. How many wants to be a part of a strong church? I hope I'm part of a strong church, amen? Uh, but because of this, there's always the danger of differences of opinion. Where there's a multitude of people, there's always going to be a difference of opinion. Right. Amen. That's why I want to talk a little bit about unity in the spirit. How many knows that before we can have unity in the spirit, we need to have unity in the home? That's right. Amen. Amen. We need to have unity in the home. That's right. Ah, what makes up the church? Well, I'm the church. You're the church. We the the body of believers is the church. Amen. And uh, if you're single, well, praise the Lord. You make up the church. If you're married, well, guess what? You make up the church. Amen. Uh, how many knows that families today are under attack by the devil? Amen. They're under attack by the devil. He doesn't want families to be unified. Because if families aren't unified, the church isn't going to be too unified. That's right. If he can bring division in the home, well, he can bring division in the church. Amen. Because that's what makes up the church is the families. Amen. Amen. So that's why we need to be on our guard and, and be not ignorant of the enemy's devices. Okay? That's right. Amen. But anyway, there's always going to be differences of opinion where there's a multitude of people. Differences in vision, desires, concern, emphasis, and interest. There's always different ideals as to which ministry or project should be undertaken and supported. And a host of other differences. The point is this, the more strength and activity a church has, the more attention it must give to unity. Why? Because a strong church has more minds and bodies working, and where people, more people are working, more differences are bound to arise. So we need to concentrate on unity. Amen? Amen. Unity in the spirit. He knew that he had to put the Philippian church on guard. That's why Paul's writing to the Philippians. They were a strong church. But he also knew that strong churches could have problems. Amen? He also knew that strong churches could be divided. Not be unified in the spirit. Uh, the church had to protect itself against disunity and division. And this is the subject of Philippians 2, the steps to unity. Uh, the first step to unity is Christ. How many knows we've got to be, uni have be unified with Christ? Amen. Allowing his life to be lived out in us. And I want to talk about seven traits today that will hold the church together and keep it unified. We're going to talk about seven traits today. And I'm not going to keep you a real long time today. We're just going to talk about seven traits. We're going to talk about the trait of consolation, the trait of love, the trait of fellowship, the trait of compassion, 
the trait of concern for one another's joy, the trait of humility or lowliness of mind, the trait of controlling self-interest or concentration upon oneself. Now let me read Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. It says, if any, or it says, if you have any encouragement from being uni uh, un united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. Everybody say, make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. By, lay, by being like-minded. How many knows God wants us to be like-minded? Yes. Having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but to the interest of of others. Amen. Man. Paul wanted his joy to be complete. He wants our joy to be complete. Now, how many knows that if you're in unity with one another, your joy is complete? That's just like what I was talking about in the family, in the home. If you, if you don't have joy, <laughs> you're not unified. Amen. That's right. That's why the enemy wants to bring division and discord among families. Uh, that's why we need to, uh, you know, church begins in the family. That's why we need to overlook and bear one another's burdens and overlook one another's faults and just pray for one another. Amen. Amen. Lift one another up. You know, that that's uh, where church starts is in the home. Amen. But anyway, I want to talk about consolation just a little bit. There's a trait of consolation. Uh, the word means many things throughout Scripture, but in the present context, it means encouragement. How many of us like to be encouraged? I like to be encouraged, amen? But in the present context, uh, it means encouragement, comfort, solace, exhortation, and strengthening. Note that this trait is a characteristic of Christ himself. Amen. Christ himself. The very beat of his spirit is to encourage, comfort, and strengthen. God wants us to be strong in our Christian walk with him. You know, he wants us to be one in spirit and busy about the ministry of his church. Amen. And if we're all off being disunified out of unity somewhere, we're not fulfilling the God's gospel call for our life. Amen. So that's why he wants us to love one another. Remember I've talked in weeks past about bearing one another's burdens and lifting one another up and, and, and helping one another. And, you know, see the devil wants to bring all this discord among us to bring us out of unity in our walk with God. Amen. Amen. Christ wants no murmuring, no grumbling, no disturbance or weakening of the unity within the church. Now, I remember I told you that the Philippian church was a strong church. But, you know, the more people there are, the more division there could possibly be. Uh, you know, the spirit of Christ is to take the disturbed or upset person and console him, comfort him, encourage him, and strengthen him. Now guess what? Guess how Christ works today. You know, he's not standing right here, right next to me, comforting me and consoling me and encouraging me, but he'll use a, he'll use a believer to do that. He'll work through a believer, amen? So that's what we're to do. That's what we're called to do. And if you're not unified in your own home, how are you going to consult someone in somebody else's home, amen? That's right. So church begins in the home. Unity begins in the home i can't stress enough about the home because that's where church begins to start that's with right. amen, amen. Uh, okay. i hate to say it but there were a few times me and susie would have a few words where we went to church then i didn't even feel like going to church amen and vice versa, and vice versa. <laughs> so i mean that that's been years ago now no <laughs> But uh, anyway, 
Uh, God wants us to be in unity with one another, even That's husband right. and wife and That's children right. and parents. And Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath is what my wife said. Uh, now glance at the charge of Philippians 2.2. 2. It says, be like-minded. Everybody say like-minded. Like-minded. Be just like Christ. Console, comfort, encourage, exhort, and strengthen each other. Let absolutely nothing interfere with the spirit of unity in the church. We're not only to help those who are disturbed, we're to let the comfort and encouragement of Christ flow in us when we are disturbed. Amen? Amen. So sometimes we need to encourage your own self. How do you do that? Well, you encourage yourself in the Word. Amen? That's right. You encourage yourself in God. Amen? Amen. Because sometimes there's not always going to be somebody... Uh, in tune with the spirit enough to bring encouragement to you you just got to encourage yourself in the lord that's right and my wife has done that and she's told me about doing that in times gone by she just you know got happy by just sharing in god's word to herself amen amen uh <clears throat> just imagine the spirit of unity that would flow through a church if all the members would let the consolation of Christ flow through them, there would be no murmuring, grumbling, disturbance, or disunity whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The second trait I want to talk about this morning is the trait of love. There is comfort of love that is in Christ. Uh, the love of Christ stirs a person to keep the unity with other believers. The word love is agape love, and that's that selfless sacrifice official love, amen, that kind of love that God has for us. Uh, agape love is the love of the mind, of, of the reason, of the will. It is a love that goes so far that if a person, even if he does not, des or th that it loves a person even if he's not worthy of being loved, amen. Now that's the kind of love that God has. Amen. Agape love is the love of Christ. Amen. Agape love is what sent Christ to the cross. Agape love is what God the Father used to send Christ to the cross. Amen. Amen. You know, we did not deserve it, that kind of love, and we're utterly unworthy of such love. Yet Christ loved us despite all. Amen. Imagine the spirit of unity that would exist within a church if every member would let the love of Christ flow through him. I remember... Growing up and years gone by and times gone by when I'd just see someone, you could just feel the love coming from them. You know, especially in church, you know, it's just almost like they had a glow about them, you know. Just because they were just, seemed to be so full of the love of Christ, amen. I remember that, you know, and I thought, oh man, yeah. I like being around them, you know. And, uh, but uh, anyway, so anyway, uh, the next trait I want to talk about is fellowship in the spirit. Fellowship in the spirit or fellowship. Amen. How many knows God wants us to fellowship? He wants us to fellowship. He doesn't want us to be an island to ourselves. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, I, I tend to be that way. I tend to be an island to myself. Other than my family, you know, my, my, my people close to me. You know, I need to get out and fellowship with other believers. Amen. Amen. I need to take my wife and, or she needs to drag me by the hair and take me out. And we need to fellowship with other believers. Amen. <laughs> uh, how many knows that you can also have a lot of fun doing that? And you can strengthen one another doing that. Amen. Uh you know, the Holy Spirit enters believer's heart and life to comfort, guide, teach, equip, and use him as a witness for Christ. The Holy Spirit creates a spiritual union between the new believer and other believers. He melts and molds the heart of the believer. And, uh, and he melts and molds the heart of believers to other believers. Amen? You know, God wants us to have friends. He wants us to do fun things. He wants us to go on retreats sometimes, you know. Amen? Amen. And uh, he wants us to, to fellowship with one another. 
you know, he just kind of attaches their, our lives together and they become one in life and purpose. They have a joint life sharing their blessings and needs and gifts together, all focused upon their Lord and his purpose. The mind of the Holy Spirit is set upon unity and fellowship. And of course, centered around Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, God doesn't want us to get together and talk about bad news or gossip or rumors or have clicks or or anything that would disturb, you know, uh, uh, unity, especially in the fellowship of the Spirit within the church. Amen. Be of one accord. Keep the unity of the Spirit, the fellowship of the Spirit. The next trait I'd like to talk about is compassion. Compassion is a trait to stir Christ to reach out to us. Have you ever been full of compassion for somebody? So what's compassion? It's the force that drives him to keep us, keep after his time and again. Even if we're in rebellion or stand opposed to him, Christ has that kind of compassion. You know, I've had compassion. I've had compassion on family members. I've had compassion on people who didn't even know. People I heard about that was in the hospital. You'd go, you'd pray for them. You just sense and feel the compassion of God. I've had people ask me to pray for someone I don't even know, and I just feel the compassion of God to pray for them. Amen? Uh, amen. If... If we allow his compassion to flow through us, if we, uh, God can do many great things through us. Amen. You know, compassion can reach out and touch someone. Uh, used to be a saying, reach out and touch someone. You know, we can touch someone with compassion from afar or right next to them. Amen. Uh, what would happen if we were driven by compassion to go after those who have been hurt, who differed, who withdrew, who have been disturbed, who were critical? The list goes on and on. And just think how many have already been reconciled. Compassion can reconcile. Amen. Uh, back into the fellowship of church if we had been compassionate and gone after them. Uh, just think how much less trouble would have happened if we reached out in compassion when a difference first appeared. You know, if differences appear between you and your family or friends, just reconcile. You know, so many people want to get the last word in. You know, uh, I think Sue's, my wife's even told me that she's tended to be like that sometimes where she just wanted to get the last word in. Well, I guess I've done the same thing. I just wanted to get the last word in. How about if we just reconcile? And man, let that compassion, yeah. we just reconcile and just get over it. Amen. You got mad, you can get glad. Amen? That's right. Amen. You got mad, you can get glad. Uh, but anyway, how many knows that the compassion of Jesus Christ flowing in and through us keeps unity in the church? It will also keep our minds together. How many wants to keep your mind together? Amen. Keep them focused upon the needs of a world that must be reached and ministered to in compassion. The next trait I want to talk about is the trait of joy. The believers in the church are to be concerned about one another's joy. Uh, and the one thing I mentioned earlier is that one thing that will bring joy quicker than anything is unity. Uh, remember, you, you know, I made mention of been having unity in the home. Well, that's going to bring joy. Amen. Uh, Philippians 2, 2 says, Fulfill, and this is the King James, it says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Paul's point is simple, but direct. His joy in Christ would be fulfilled by only one thing, the unity of the Philippian church. The leaders and members of a church usually have joy in Christ, but their joy can be fulfilled only if unity exists between them. Uh, and as we've talked about, joy is always disturbed where there's criticism, dissatisfaction, grumbling, murder, murmuring, clicks, opposition, and a host of other divisive negatives. We are to worship 
plan, organize, program, build, staff, finance, minister, and serve in the joy of Christ. Amen. But the only way we can do that is to be like-minded, to have the same love, to be of one accord, to be of one mind. Uh, the next trait I want to talk about is the trait of humility or lowliness of mind. You know, there's two significant points. A strong and active church will always have two problems to stick their ugly heads up, and that's strife and empty glory. Strife and empty glory. Amen. Some people are just going to strive with others. You know, they're just going to strive with others, cause strife. Uh, they are not mature in the Lord, not yet. Therefore, they give in to talking about differences, desire for position, desire for recognition. How many knows when you have a strong church and you have a multitude of people, there's always going to be that group that wants to think of themselves more than they should. Amen. And that there's going to be strife and there's going to be jealousy. There's going to be envy. And they're going to be loving flattery. That's the worst thing we could do is flatter someone because a lot of people eat that up. You know, and oppositions and forming cliques. God doesn't want us to be in cliques, amen. In churches sometimes there's cliques. This group will hang out with that group and not that group. And this group will hang out with this group and not that group. God wants us to all be one, mine, one accord, amen. So what if someone comes in who, whose clothes aren't the best looking in the world? God wants us to fellowship with them too, amen? Yeah. Or maybe this one's got diamond rings everywhere. Of course God wants you to fellowship with them, amen? But he doesn't want us to esteem others higher than, yeah. than you know, than other people. Uh, you know, a lot of these people, if they don't get their way or what they want, they strive against the church or other members. Uh, the result is disunity and divisiveness, one of the most terrible crimes within the church of God. I heard this one guy say, well, bless God, I gave this church $10,000. I think we, why aren't you doing what I, what I want? Why aren't you, you know, I, I heard that with my own ears about how much money he gave. Well, big deal. You gave it to God, not That's to man. Right. Amen. Amen. It's not up to you what it's not you're not the pastor. Why should you try to run the church? Amen. You need to be in unity with the pastor. If you're gonna have that kind of attitude, keep your ten thousand dollars, amen. <laughs> amen. The spirit that must prevail in a strong church is that of humility or lowliness of mind. In fact, the only way a church can remain strong and be blessed by God is for its people to walk in a spirit of humility. We need to be humble. Christ was humble. He was the one that spoke the world into existence, yet he went and died on a cross between two Two thieves, two criminals. Amen. And that's becoming humble. <laughs> Man. And then there's a trait of controlling self-interest. Very simply, a Christian believer must forget himself. He must quit looking upon his own things, his, his own ambitions, desires, position, it shouldn't matter to him if he's not recognized. It doesn't, shouldn't matter to him if he's not honored. It doesn't matter if he gets his wants or being neglected, being overlooked, being bypassed, being ignored, not being given the position. You know, so many people, I've heard people say, well, he didn't even shake my hand. That preacher didn't even shake my hand. Well, it's not that he didn't want to shake it. It's just... Sometimes you get, you know, your mind on on a certain track and you overlook things, amen? Of course he wants to shake hands. There's a lot of churches where the pastor make you wait to leave so he can get to the back door to shake your hands, amen? 
You know, and I, I respect that. I honor that. Amen. Believers are to concentrate upon Christ and his ministry to people. This is what we're to do. We're not to care about our own ambitions, desires, position, you know. And and we're to reach out to a world with the glorious gospel of salvation, which we're going to give you a chance to receive here in just a few minutes. The world is too needful and too desperate for any believer to be focused upon himself. Man, that's exactly what the devil wants you to do is be focused on yourself. What happens when you're focused on yourself? You forget it about the lost and dying world that needs what you might have to say. Amen. Amen. They might be looking to you for an example. They might be looking to you for an example. Every believer is needed to reach the lost and lonely, the shut-ins and helpless, the hungry and cold, the sinful and doomed of this community and city, country and world. Now my wife and I, we used to have nursing home ministries and week after tiring 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 week we would go and minister to these shut-ins to these people in the nursing homes and we would win some of them to the Lord too amen but I tell you there was no pay uh, you bought your own gas. You paid your own way. But it was a blessing for them to grab your hand and start kissing on it. Because it meant so much for them for you to, to them for you to come be with them like that. Amen. But my wife and I will have a reward for doing that in heaven. Because we were selfless. We, we weren't selfish. We, we didn't think about ourselves. Amen. And if anything, I'm bragging on my wife because if I can best remember, she's the one that got me started into doing that to start with. Amen. And uh, so you you uh, be thinking about others' interests before your own. Amen. Every believer does not need to be thinking of his own things, but on the things of others. He needs to be out. Now listen to this. This is what God wants us to be. This is the end of my message. He wants us to be visiting, ministering, helping, transporting, listening, advising, sharing, feeding, clothing, counseling, planning, teaching. That's what God wants us to do. And if we're listening to the devil, we're not doing none of the above. Amen. We have confusion, and if there's division in the home, we're not doing any of the above. Amen. That's why the devil tries so hard to disrupt a home, because that's where church begins. Amen. Everybody, look at yourself and say, "I'm the church." I'm the church. And you are the church. If you're disunified, well, the church you go to is going to be disrupted. Amen. Well, I hope that you've been blessed by the Word of God. I've entitled that Unity in the Spirit. And it's just a message that the Lord laid on my heart. I guess last Monday, I usually, you know, seek the Lord on Mondays. And, and He gives them to me. And, and I write them down. And, and by the grace of God, I share them with all of you. Amen? Amen. And uh, so anyway... Keep the faith, keep unified, be unified in the spirit. And I'm going to ask my lovely wife to come. My wife is going to share Jesus with you. That was a wonderful word of the Lord. We need to have unity in the body of Christ. And, you know, all of us, um, our human nature is to be self-centered and to think of ourselves first. But God wants us to be like Jesus and in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8 it says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made of himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself 
even to death, even to the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He was the son of the living God. He came from heaven down to earth, but he humbled himself um, in the form of, of man. To, and God wants us to have that humble attitude in our hearts and us to have unity in the body of Christ. If we have unity, there's nothing that will be withheld from us. And yes, we are all different. We all have our own personalities. But when it comes to the things of God, let us have unity. Let us be of one mind and one accord. And like Pastor Steve said on the day of Pentecost, the believers were in one mind. There was about 120 of them in the upper room. And they were all seeking God together. All these different people, all these different personalities. There was fishermen, there was doctors, there was uh, probably lawyers, there was tax collector, former tax collectors. They're all different walks of life. But they came together in unity to seek the Lord. And there will be, oh my goodness, God wants us to have that heart so he can use us. And when we come to that place in the body of Christ, uh, we're going to see the power of God fall and use us like never before. Hallelujah. And you've been watching and, and you, wanna, you want to be a child of God. You want to have uh, this inheritance. You want to do something for the Lord. And you say, how do I do that? I, I, I'm too bad. I've done too many bad things. Well, God has given you an opportunity. God sent his, his uh, only begotten son who was perfect in every way to make the sacrifice and pay the penalty for your sin. He died on a cross. He took your punishment upon himself and he rose again on the third day that we could live a life of victory. If you want to ask Jesus to come in your heart, this is your opportunity. Father in heaven, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Pray this prayer with me. Father in heaven, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and be Lord over my life. If you prayed that prayer with me in faith, believing, now you are a child of God and all your past, all your guilt has been wiped away. You have a clean start starting right now. Get you a holy Bible. Start reading it and see what God has for you. Oh! <laughs>